Hello, and welcome back to Storytime with Eric Zimmer. Where we last left off in the Trumpet of the Swan, we learned that one of the Signets, who is said to be the most intelligent by his father, is named Lewis, and he was born mute. That means he can't talk or make a sound. And although his father is disappointed by this, he has vowed to help Lewis in every way he possibly can to give him a voice. Now that's what you call devotion to your child. And now they have all learned to fly and are migrating south to the Red Rock Lakes in Montana. What great wonders and adventure lies ahead, no one can say. But now we're about to find out. So you ready? All right, let's begin. <clears throat> Chapter 7, School Days. A few days after the swans arrived at their winter home on the Red Rock Lakes, Lewis had an idea. He decided that since he was unable to use his voice, he should learn to read and write. If I'm defective in one respect, he said to himself, I should try and develop myself along other lines. I will learn to read and write. Then I will hang a small slate around my neck and carry a chalk pencil. In that way, I will be able to communicate with anybody who can read. Hmm, that's a pretty interesting thing to learn. Lewis liked company, and he already had many friends on the lake. The place was a refuge of, for water birds, swans, geese, ducks, and other waterfowl. They lived there because it was a safe place and because the water stayed warm even in the coldest winter weather. <clears throat> Lewis was greatly admired for his ability as a swimmer. Excuse me. He liked to compete with the other cygnets to see who could swim underwater the greatest distance and stay down, stay down the longest. When Lewis had fully made up his mind about learning to read and write, he decided to visit Sam Beaver and get help from him. Perhaps, thought Lewis, Sam will let me go to school with him and the teacher will show me how to write. The idea excited him. He wondered whether a young swan would be accepted in a classroom of children. He wondered whether it was hard to learn to read. Most of all, he wondered whether if he could find Sam. Montana is a big state, and he wasn't even sure Sam lived in Montana, but he hoped he did. Next morning, when his parents were not looking, Lewis took off into the air. He flew northeast. When he came to the Yellowstone River, he followed it to the sweet grass country. When he saw a town beneath him, he landed next to the schoolhouse and waited for the boys and girls to be let out. Lewis looked at every boy, hoping to see Sam. But Sam wasn't there. Wrong town, wrong school, thought Lewis. I'll try again. He flew off, found another town, and located the school. But all the boys and girls had gone home for the day. I'll just have a look around anyway, thought Lewis. He didn't dare walk down the main street for fear somebody would shoot him. Instead, he took to the air and circled around, flying low and looking, every, looking carefully at every boy in sight. After about ten minutes, he saw a ranch house where a boy was splitting wood near the kitchen door. The boy had black hair. Lewis glided down. I'm lucky, he thought. It's Sam. When Sam saw the swan, he laid down his axe and stood perfectly still. Lewis walked up timidly and reached down and untied Sam's shoelace. Hello, said Sam in a friendly voice. Lewis tried to say Kaho, but not a sound came out from his throat. I know you, said Sam. You're the one that never said anything and used to pull my shoelaces. Lewis nodded. I'm glad to see you, said Sam. What can I do for you? Lewis just stared straight ahead. You hungry? asked Sam. Lewis shook his head. Thirsty? Lewis shook his head. Do you want to stay overnight with us here at the ranch? asked Sam. Lewis nodded his head and jumped up and down. Okay, said Sam. We have plenty of room. It's just a question of getting my father's permission. Sam picked up his axe, laid a stick of wood on the chopping, blocks, chopping block, and split the neck stick neatly down the middle. He looked at Lewis. There's something wrong with your voice, isn't it? he asked. Lewis nodded, pumping his neck up and down hard. He knew Sam was his friend, although he didn't know that Sam had once saved his mother's life. In a few minutes, Mr. Beaver rode into the yard on a cow pony. He got off and tied his pony to a rail. What have you got there? he asked Sam. It's a young trumpeter swan, said Sam. He's only a few months old. 
Will you let me keep him for a while? Well, listen, Mr. Beaver, I think it's against the law to hold one of these wild birds in captivity, but I'll phone the game warden and see what he says. If he says yes, you can keep him. Tell the warden the swan has something the matter with him, called Sam as his father started towards the house. What's wrong with him? Asked his father. He has a speech problem, replied Sam. Something's wrong with his throat. What are you talking about? Who ever heard of a swan with a speech problem? Well, said Sam, this is a trumpeter swan that can't trumpet. He's defective. He can't make a sound. Mr. Beaver looked at his son and, as though he didn't know whether to believe him or not. But he went into the house. In a few mo minutes, he came back. The warden says you can keep the young swan here for a while if you can help him. But sooner or later, the bird will have to go back to the Red Rock Lakes where he belongs. The warden said he wouldn't just let anybody have a young swan, but he'd let you have one because you understand about birds and he trusts you. That's quite a compliment, son. Mr. Beaver looked pleased. Sam looked happy. Lewis was greatly relieved. After a while, everyone went into s summer supper in the kitchen of the ranch house. Mrs. Beaver allowed Lewis to stand beside Be Sam's chair. They fed him some corn and some oats, which tasted good. When Sam was ready for bed, he wanted Lewis to sleep in his room with him. But Mrs. Beaver said no. He'll mess up the room. He's no canary. He's enormous. Put the bird out in the barn. He can sleep in one of the empty stalls. The horses won't mind. The next morning, Sam took Lewis to school with him. Sam rode his pony, and Lewis flew along. At the schoolhouse, the other children were amazed to see the great bird with his long neck, bright eyes, and big feet. Sam introduced him to the teacher of the first grade, Mrs. Hammerbotham, who was short and fat. Sam explained that Lewis wanted to read and write because he was unable to make any sound with his throat. Mrs. Hammerbotham stared at Lewis. Then she shook her head. No bird, she said. I've got enough trouble. Sam looked disappointed. Please, Mrs. Hammerbotham, he said. Please let him stand in your class and learn to read and write. Why does a bird need to read and write, replied the teacher. Only people need to communicate with one another. That's not true. That's not quite true, Mrs. Hammerbotham, said Sam. See what I mean? Now, if you... Now, if you excuse me for saying so, I have watched bir I have watched birds and animals a great deal. All birds and animals talk to one another. They really have to in order to get along. Mothers have to talk to their young. Males have to talk to females, particularly in the spring of the year when they are in love. In love? said Mrs. Hammerbotham, who seemed to perk up at this suggestion. Who, what do you know about love? Apparently a great more than you do. Sam blushed. What kind of bird is he, she asked. He's a young trumpeter swan, said Sam. Right now he's sort of a dirty gray color, but in another year he'll be the most beautiful thing you ever saw. Pure white with black bi uh, and black feet. He was hatched last spring in Canada and now lives in the Red Rock Lakes. But he can't say coho the way the other swans can, and this puts him at a terrible disadvantage. Why, asked the teacher. Because it does, said Sam. If you wanted to say coho and couldn't make a single solitary sound, wouldn't you feel worry? I don't want to say coho, replied the teacher. I don't even know what it means. Anyways, this is all foolishness, Sam. What makes you think a bird can learn to read and write? It's impossible. Give him a chance, pleaded Sam. He is well behaved and he's bright, and he's got this very serious speech defect. What's his name? I don't know, replied Sam. Well, said Mrs. Hammerbotham, if he's coming into my class, he's got to have a name. Maybe we can find out what it is. She looked at the bird. Is your name jo Oh, Lewis shook his head. Jonathan? Lewis shook his head. At a second time. Donald? Lewis shook his head again a third time. Is your name... Lewis? asked Mrs. Hammerbotham. Lewis nodded his head very hard and jumped up and down and flapped his wings. Great Caesar's ghost, cried the teacher. Look at those wings. Well, his name is Lewis. That's for sure. All right, Lewis, you may join the class. Stand right here by the blackboard, and don't mess up the room either. If you need to go outdoors for any reason, raise one wing. Lewis nodded. 
The first graders cheered. They liked the looks of the new pupil and were eager to see what he could do. Quiet, children, said Mrs. Hammerbotham sternly. We'll start with the letter A. She picked up a piece of chalk and made a big A on the blackboard. Now you try it, Lewis. Lewis picked, grabbed a piece of chalk in his bill and drew a perfect A right under the one the teacher had drawn. You see, said Sam, it's an, he's an unusual bird. Huh? Well, said Mrs. Hammerbotham, A is easy. I'll give him something harder. She wrote cat on the board. Let's see you write cat, Lewis. Lewis wrote cat. Well, cat is easy too, muttered the teacher. Cat is easy because it is short. Can anyone think of a word that is longer than cat? Catastrophe, said Charlie Nelson, who sat in the first row. Good, said Mrs. Hammerbotham. That's a good hard word. D but, but, but does anyone know what it means? What is catastrophe? An earthquake, said one of the girls. Correct, replied the teacher. What else? War is a catastrophe, said Charlie Nelson. Correct, said Mrs. Hammerbotham. What else is? A very small red-haired girl named Jenny raised her hand. Yes, Jenny? What is catastrophe? In a very small high voice, Jenny said... When you get ready to go on a picnic with your father and mother, and you bring make peanut butter sandwiches and jelly rolls and put them in a thermos box with bananas and an apple and some raisin cookies and paper napkins and some bottles of pop and a few hard-boiled eggs, and then you put the thermos box in your car, and just as you are starting out, it starts to rain, and your parents say there is no point in having a picnic in the rain. That's a catastrophe. Hmm. Very good, Jenny, said Mrs. Hammerbotham. It isn't a, as bad as an earthquake, and it isn't as bad as war, but when a picnic gets called on account of rain, it is a catastrophe for a child, I guess. Anyway, catastrophe is a good word. No bird can write that word, I'll bet. If I, I can teach a bird to write catastrophe, it'll be big news all over the sweetgrass country. I'll get my picture in Life magazine. I'll be famous. <laughs> the bird will be famous. Thinking of all these things, she stepped onto the blackboard and wrote, Catastrophe. Okay, Lewis, let's see you write that. Hmm. Lewis picked up a fresh piece of chalk in his bill. He was scared. He took a good look at the word. A long word, he thought. It re is really no harder than a short one. I'll just copy one letter at a time, and pretty soon it will be finished. Besides, my life is a catastrophe. It is a catastrophe to be without a voice. Then he began writing... Catastrophe, he wrote, making each letter very neatly. When he got to the last letter, the pupils clapped and stamped their feet and banged on their desks, and one boy quickly made a paper airplane, and it zoomed into the air. Mrs. Hammer bought them wrapped for order. Very good, Lewis, she said. Sam, it's time you went to your own classroom. You shouldn't be in my room. Go and join the fifth grade. I'll take care of your friend the swan. Back in his own room, Sam de sat down at his desk feeling very happy about the way things had turned out. The fifth graders were having an a lesson on arithmetic, and their teacher, Mrs. Annie Snug, greeted Sam with a question. Mrs. Snug was young and pretty. Sam, if a man can walk three miles in one hour, how many miles can he walk in four hours? Words. It would depend on how tired he got after the first hour, replied Sam. The other pupils roared with laughter. Mrs. Snug rapped for order. Sam is quite right, she said. I never looked at the problem that way before. I always supposed that a man could walk 12 miles in four hours, but Sam may be right. The man may not feel so spunky after the first hour. He may drag his feet. He may slow off. Albert Bigelow raised his hand. My father knew a man who tried to walk 12 miles, and he died of heart failure, said Albert. He must have not been in good health. Goodness, said the teacher. I suppose that could happen, too. Anything can happen in four hours, said Sam. A man might develop a blister on his heel, or he might find some berries growing along the road and stop to pick them. That would slow him up even if he wasn't tired or didn't have a blister. It would indeed, agreed the teacher. Well, children, I think we have all learned a great deal about arithmetic this morning, thanks to Sam Beaver. And now there's here's a problem for one of the girls in the room. 
If you are feeding a baby from a bottle and you give the baby eight ounces of milk in one feeding, how many ounces of milk would the baby drink in two feedings? Linda Staples raised her hand. About 15 ounces, she said. Why is that? asked Mrs. Snug. Why wouldn't the baby drink 16 ounces? Because he spills a little each time, said Linda. It runs out of the corners of his mouth and gets on his mother's apron. By that... By this time, the class was howling with laughter so loudly the arithmetic lesson had to be abandoned. But everyone had learned how careful you have to be when dealing with figures. To be continued.